Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So today I will try to uh, give some intuition on why people would define monad in the first place rather than give you um, a set of rules or the definition altogether. A um, couple of words about me. So I am currently a senior software engineer at Twitter Cortex. I, um, this, these slides are on, on my Twitter, so if you want to follow along, um, feel free to grab them from there. I actually lived here for three winters, and it was too cold or too hot, sometimes at, uh, at the same time for me. So I moved to, I decided to move to sunny California to do machine learning. And you might have noticed that sunny is um, italic, um, italic there, mostly because this is what I was expecting, and this is what I found. <laughs> So San Francisco is an awesome city, but it's not what you would expect when you say California. Anywho, let's start with a graph. So what do you think this graph represents? Is it stock, Bitcoin, oil prices? <laughs> That's a, a good, almost. <laughs> this is the number of mono tutorials. <laughs> that have been tracked by askhill.org website. Um, and so, unfortunately, it stopped in 2010 for some reason, but um, we should all invest it in monet futures rather than bitcoins. <laughs> and, you know, when you try to Google and see, like, okay, what is a monad? Usually people will tell you something like that. It's like, <laughs> sure, whatever. Thank you, that's very helpful. But no, nobody actually takes the time to ask why. Why would you even do something like that? Um, and there is a reason, which is composition. So today I will try to convince you that introducing these objects will actually help writing cleaner and better programs. So just to give you an example, and we'll come back to, uh, to this uh, example later, I want to go from this code which you might see um, has a lot of duplication. It's not really nice to see, even to you know, look at visually, to this other code, which is much cleaner, and you can even follow the arrows in case you're lost. So the plan for today is talk a little bit about Haskell. Um, as uh, someone said earlier, I too uh, agree that Haskell is kind of cleaner language to define this com uh, concept. Then I will uh, talk about what a functor is and um, how this helps us abstract a pattern. And then we'll move to monads that are some sort of functor on steroids. So the reason, as I mentioned, uh, I want to use Haskell for two reasons. One I already mentioned, which is it's a cleaner language. And two, because I really wanted to use um, <laughs> XKCD. So that being said, um, let me give you just a few um, introductory pointers on Haskell so that you can better follow along. So in Haskell, it's a purely functional la language. Um, it's really easy and uh, as a very minimalistic uh, um, syntax for defining a uh, function. So for example, here we're trying to define a function f that as you might imagine goes from int to int and there are no parentheses. So um, f of x here is just, you know, adds one to, to x. So when you call it, um, again, no parentheses, you obtain three. Um, not very, uh, nothing very special here. Um, what about function of two variables? So now it's a little more confusing because there are more arrows. Uh, but the, it's the same concept. So basically, think about everything that's before the last arrow as an input and everything that's after the last arrow is your output. So specifically, this function is going to take two integer as an input, and it's going to return an integer as an output. And you can see from the definition there, it's just adding these two together. So again, if I want to call it, I'll just, no parentheses, g12 gives me three. Okay, so why there are so many arrows? That, that's kind of confusing. Well, the reason is because you can see a function of two variables in two ways. So you can see either as a function that takes two variables 
or as a function that takes one variable and returns a function which itself is one variable and returns your output. So in our case, our f that we defined earlier can be seen as a version of g where you froze uh, the first argument. And so that's why uh, there are so many arrows. But just rem remember that whatever is on the left of the last arrow is your input and the rest is, um, is the output. Cool. So let's start with a more concrete example. Let's assume I have two function, f and g. So g goes from str uh, string to integers and let's assume it will just compute the length um, of the string. Then I have f defined as before. Um, you know, it's a function that will add one to your integer. So now the question is, can I compose these two function? Uh, well, yes, and why? Um, I can compose them because the return type of g is exactly the same as the input type of f, right? So I can create a new function, let's call it h, that goes from string to int, and the way h is defined is f after g. So I apply g, um, I apply g whatever the result is, I apply f to that. Okay, so this is, you know, nothing new. Um, we just remember that, you know, we were able to compose them because the return type of the one coincides with the input type of the other. Let's now assume that I want to expand, uh, so my, I want to allow my g to fail somehow, right? So I want to be able to represent failure. So I will introduce a new data type for that, um, which is what you know as an option in Scala. So basically here, what I'm saying is, well, um, we have two options. Either your computation failed, so we return nothing, um, or your computation did not fail and return a result, and we are just going to wrap uh, the result in this just, uh, which is, again, the equivalent of some in Scala. Okay, so let's see how we modify this function g. So now, um, uh, g, we will call g maybe, instead of returning just a row int, we'll return this wrapped int, right? Uh, so a maybe int. And for example, let's assume that, you know, g, g maybe is processing URLs um, or something. So we just say, if the um, connection is not secure, we'll fail. Otherwise, we'll return a result. Cool. Now, can I compose that with f? With f? the f uh, that we defined before. Well, as we said, we have to look that the return type of g um, is the same uh, with the input type of f. They're not really the same, but they're kind of related, right? One is maybe int, the other is int. So I cannot compose the way they are now, but I can try to modify my f a little bit to allow um, composition so what I could do is, well, I need f, so we'll call it f maybe now, the input type has, has to be a maybe int. Um, okay, how we do that? Well, um, so Haskell has built in pattern matching. So here we are saying if your, uh, if your um, input is a just of x, you can take the x that's inside and then apply f, f to it. But then the problem is, what do I do if the previous computation failed? What is a, a good integer that represents failure? And in general, I cannot find that. Like you could think about zero, but then zero is a legit integer value. Other, in this case, maybe, you know, we are always adding one, so, and we know that the previous step is the length of a function, so zero could be maybe, or a negative value could be a good candidate, but in general, uh, we, we don't have a universal Candidate, so that's why this is ill-defined. And the only option I have is to use something that's not in my domain. So what we have to do is to extend the domain, um, uh, the return type of f or f maybe to also be a maybe int, such that if the previous computation fail, we also have a good way of representing the failure and passing it to the next um, uh, part, part of the program, okay? 
So basically, we started with an F that went from int to int. Um, when the G changed its return type to maybe int, we had to change our F as well in both the input and the return type. Let's look at another example. So glist, uh, as you might imagine from the name, is a function that takes a string and returns a um, list of integer. So in Haskell, square bracket mean list of whatever it's inside. So now I have the same question as before. Can I compose with my f? But then again, f goes from int to int. So I can try to change the, the input type, but leave the um, output type untouched. And I have the same problem as before. I don't really know how to deal with that in a meaningful way, because I still want to have a behavior that's consistent with, you know, um, I don't want to create just a new function that goes from list of int to int. So um, I have to do what I, um, I did earlier, which is change not only the input type, but also the return type of f. Um, and you know, the way we change this, um, um, the way we define f list is, you know, if I have an empty list, again, here we're using pattern matching. So if I have an empty list, I'll return an empty list. If I have something in my list, I will just map my original f to the list. Okay, so we have seen this, um, you know, pattern repeating. So we started with g and f, they were composable. Then we changed g, um, specifically we, we changed g's return type and we had to adapt f um, somehow um, in a way that you know, could be composable still with G. And you see that the way we, we adapted that is we kind of enhance the type of, of, of F. So for example, we start with int and then we add a maybe int, which again is not the same but related. And with, with list was the same, right? Um, so we, we change from int to int to list to int to li um, list of integer to list of integer. So we, we had two functions that we were able to compose. We change G to return the special types, and then we have to change F accordingly. But the question is why F? Um, F's job is just to add one. Is not to, uh, is not to, F is not responsible to whatever upstream craziness happens. Um, maybe half lives in a library and you know, we cannot, we are not able to change F every time. So the G should tell us how it should play with, um, play nicely with function downstream. So this pattern that we have encountered uh, up to now, we'll call it functor. Um, and think about a functor as something that implements a function called map. So let's see what this um, map function is. So let's look at the, um, uh, at the signature there. So map is a function that takes as a first argument a function and then as a, as a second argument takes um, this fa, which we can think about like uh, our enhanced type like maybe um, and returns another, for example, maybe. And if we change, if we add parentheses here, it's way, way cleaner because now we see that map is a function that takes a function and returns another function. But the, the, the difference is that the, the original function is from regular types and the return function is among these enhanced types. Okay, so basically what we did is that we took a regular function and we made this function work with these special types where the special types are kind of the same type as before, but we, we put something um, in front of that. So let's, let's look at um, our example uh, with maybe and list once again uh, to hopefully get more clarity. So the first line again is the gen uh, general definition. The second line is our specific maybe case, okay? So I just said, what if f is maybe? Okay, let's define this map. Okay, ignore the instant functor maybe where, that's just syntax, but now 
we are defining what map is using, again, pattern matching. So we are saying, if you have map of a function, but then your maybe A is a nothing, remember, maybe A is, is an option, so it allows for failure, then do not worry about F, just discard whatever, re return the same failure. On the other hand, if your previous computation properly return and you have a value x that's wrapped in this just, you can take this value, apply f to that, and then rewrap everything. And why is that useful for us? Because the f maybe function that we defined earlier is now just the composition between this new map function we just defined and our original f. Um, so maybe, like maybe the functor um, tells us how you can adapt regular function to work on maybe types. Okay, so let's look at uh, list now. Again, um, the first line is, um, is the general definition and the second line is when f is a list. So let's define one more time using pattern matching how this works. So if we have an empty list, it is not important what your uh, function is, you just return an empty list. If you have something in your, in your list, you recursive, recursively de define um, map, and this is just like the map that you expect from a list. So you're applying the function item-wise to, to the list. And again, why is that useful? Uh, because the F list that we defined earlier is nothing more than map applied to F. So we don't need to change F um, if we know who map is. So just to have a quick recap, um, these enhanced special types, like maybe or list, um, have defined this map function that tells us how we can go from a function from regular type to these special types. And we can still compose by um, having map after f. Okay, so note that I can compose with special types without having to change anything about f. Um, because every, all the information I need is inside map. Okay, good. So let's play a game now. So. The game is very easy. I give you cards. You have some cards in your hand, um, and we'll count the total. So everything is an integer. Just to make um, things clearer, I'm just calling uh, the value of the card card, and the total in your hand deck. Okay. So the the game works. Um, in you know there is a function that adds um, another card to your total. So the way, the way it works is, um, I give you a card, we have the total, the, so the second argument, remember the deck that's in the middle of the second argument, so this function takes two argument, a new card and your previous total, and returns a new total. And you know the way it does that is literally by summing these two values. Okay, so let's start the game. So one card, it's type deck, remember deck is like the total. You start from zero, which is uh, the rightmost um, uh, argument, and you add five. Okay, so you have five now in your hand. We want to add another card. Let's say we want to add a four. We can compose these two things uh, by adding, uh, composing the function add card, add card four with your previous result. Um, and by, definition, by the definition I uh, showed you earlier, this is equivalent to um, having an, like a nested function like that. Now, what happens if we keep going? Um, I mean, nothing special, right? I just keep adding stuff. So the only problem here is, you know, at some point it's maybe less readable, um, and it's, it's very nested. So you have to read from the inside out, which is something pretty common but um, no, nothing, nothing really new. But then the question is, this is not um, a very interesting game. Can we make it more interesting? You can never, it's not even a game, or just keep adding until overflow or something. Um, so let's redefine the game. Let's now 
decide that, uh, you know, if the total of your um, new card and your previous deck is, you know, 10 or bigger, then you are going to fail. So the way we want to represent this failure, as we said earlier, is by using the maybe or the option. So now this new, we change this function a little bit. So now it takes a card, it takes a deck. So card is the new card I'm giving you. Uh, deck is how, how much you already have in your hand. And we'll return a maybe deck. And the reason why there is a maybe in front of that is because now we are allowing for the game to end because um, if you have more than 10, you're going to lose. Okay, so let's try to do what we did earlier. So one card, we start from zero and uh, we give five. So that's fine. So it's a maybe deck. Now, if you remember earlier, I composed that with this one card here with um, the function add card. But can I do, can I do this now? Well, not really, because let's look at the signature. So one card is a maybe deck. And add card expects as a second argument a deck. So again, they're similar, but not, um, they're related, but not the same. So I cannot compose. So that last line there does not work. So what can we do? Well, we could um, use pattern matching, and this is the previous slide. And so we're not going to go through all of that, but if you look at the first line, basically we're saying, okay, we start from zero, we add five. This returns a maybe deck. So we remember that maybe can be two things. Well, if it's a nothing, we have to return a nothing because the, the game, um, the, game fail, the function failed, the game ends. If it's ju a just number, and we'll call this number deck one, then we can do, again, pattern matching on that and see, well, um, we'll add four to this and so on and so forth. But, I mean, hopefully you see the problem um, and it's not very nice to look at. Um, so let's see if you have a better solution, okay? So, one more time, let's look at our problem. So I have all this function and I want to, you know, um, apply all them one after the other, okay? And the, the return type of the first one do not, is not the same as the input type of the next one, but they're very similar. So let's see if I can do, if I can have a, some sort of way of doing that um, sort of composition. So what I'm really looking for is this function. So let's see what this function means. So this is a function that takes two arguments. The first argument is a maybe deck. So it's the total of your previous, um, it's the previous total in your hand. Then the second argument is itself a function and it returns a new total. Okay, so th this function turns, it turns out that this function exists and it's called bind and it is exactly what it allows us to compose our, our function. So let's see um, how it works. So we start with an empty deck. So you have zero total in your hand. So it's just zero. We add five. Remember that five, um, um, the function add, add card five expects a deck and we'll return a maybe deck. So now, if you look at the signature of the bind, you, you can convince yourself that empty deck is the maybe deck that gets inside the add card five function. Um, and if I want to do this for the full game, this is the way it, it looks. So now you can follow along what's happening. So you start with an empty deck, you add the first card, you add the second card, and so on. And so this bind function is what allowed us to compose um, these different um, add card uh, functions. So the, there is one last point that is not really, doesn't really uh, look right. So we say that empty deck is when you have um, a total of zero in your hand. 
But then how we define that? Well, a way could be to say like we add zero to zero, but this looks kind of hacky and it doesn't look like the right thing to do. So it turns out there is another thing we need to, um, to define, which is something called return. And the name here is very important because it has nothing to do with the return as in return from function. Uh, this is basically a way of saying, I'm going to cast zero into a different type. So zero is an int. Now let's cast it in like in the maybe int uh, type. So you can think this as a, the minimal context that will contain a zero. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this in one second. So I just want to tell you that basically a monad is a functor that also has return and bind defined. And so my point being that it's the responsibility of these enhance or special types to define those things. This is not F's responsibility. Okay, so let's see um, how uh, we can define these things for the two special types we introduced. So now I have um, you know, we I brought the um, signature for um, the maybe monad. So again, this is a function that takes two variables. The first one is a maybe a, the second one is, is a function, and it returns a maybe b. And we should look that as a composition because what we are trying to do here is to take the a that's in, inside the maybe a on the first line, we are feeding that to the function on the second line and we are returning whatever the second line returns. Okay, so what is the way we can cast an X into the, again, ignore instant uh, mo um, monad maybe where, but we're defining how we cast this X into the maybe uh, type. So what is the smallest context that will contain X is just X. Um, and then we have to define Find for the uh, for the um, for maybe a. So remember, maybe a can be two things: can be nothing or can be just of something. So we can use pattern matching and say, well, if it's nothing, so if the first line returns a nothing, we'll just ignore the second line and we'll just return a nothing. Otherwise, if we have a just of something and a function, we can take the x that's inside the just and apply the function to that x. Let's look at lists. So this is the signature of that function for lists. And you have, so let's read that. We have the first argument is a list. The second argument is a function that goes from each item of the list of A and returns a list of B. And the, and the return type is a list of B. So actually, we already know what bind is in this case and it's, exa it's exactly flat map. So how we define return and uh, bind for list. So again, how I cast an um, X into, into a list. Well, what is the minimalistic context that will contain X is just a list with one item, X. Um, how we define that? Well, that's very easy because we already said it's flat map. So if I have a list and a function, what do I do in the parentheses? I'm just mapping the function to the list. And so now I have a list of lists and concat is just flattern. So um, I'm just flattering everything. So to recap, we had um, two functions um, and we tried to compose them. And once again, the maybe B and the B are very similar, but not the same. So we define this bind that takes the B inside the maybe B and feeds it to F so that we could compose them and return wh um, whatever F wants to return. And so in conclusion, I hope I've kind of convinced you that the whole point of defining monads is because they help us with composing uh, different parts of our program. And that's everything I had for you today.